Today's reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. I do sincerely pray through the power of the Holy Spirit that this gospel lesson in John finds new revelation with upon this body this morning. Uh, I find that sometimes the scriptures that we're more familiar with, that we hear and um, we sing about, and uh, last week, I think, it, I think it was last week, when it was preaching on the, uh, to the children the different names of Christ, and one of them was Vine. Um, I find that sometimes these, these particular scripture readings, when we stop, and reflect upon them a little more deeply, that they can bring some, some new, um, hopefully new revelation, but also sometimes it can trouble us a little, like what does this mean? Um, I hope to bring us together as this body to a place of new discovery and new revelation, perhaps a place of a little awkwardness as we say, is this what scripture's telling us? And then see if it transforms into new hope. That is uh, a new life that is that we celebrate as Easter people. So we have a picture here, and it says the Garden of Eden. Remember that that's a clue to um, a question I'm going to share. Um, although I want you to open your mind deeper to this, this possible, um, just this this possible uh, rendition I'm putting here, and and that question is um, if. God is the father, if the father is the gardener, if father is the gardener, who is he the gardener of? Or, or where is his garden? Have you ever thought about that? Now this is a very relevant uh, scripture for us as we come into, well we think we're into spring, right? We're starting to get a glimpse of that spring season. Um, anybody here gardeners? Yeah. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe, maybe some of us like to do some uh, tomato plants. Maybe some of us, you know, have maybe a little ambitious garden that we put fruits and vegetables. Maybe some of us just like to put some flowers in our flower pots. But, but to some way or another, I mean, we're all, just about all of us are gardeners in some sense this time of year, are we not? Time to rake out some of the leaves. And um, my, my idea of gardening is, is maybe kicking some leaves out and then using the mulch mower over it. Um, <laughs> I'm not a big gardener. God the Father is being called today by Jesus as the gardener. Now what's very interesting about this Gospel of John is you've, you've all heard of parables before, right? Where, where a parable is like Jesus talking about the kingdom of heaven like something. Well, it's kind of like this or it's kind of like that. And the idea of a parable is that it's absolutely necessary for the kingdom of heaven because it's so outside of our realm of understanding that the only way we can possibly get our mind around the glories of heaven is by an analogy of like. Well, that's a parable. What we find in the Gospel of John, however, is that he kind of plays back and forth with literal and parallels, or parables. And we see this with Jesus uh, being described as the vine, or the true vine, and God as the gardener. Well, as I said, that opening slide I had, a picture of the Garden of Eden, uh, said Garden of Eden, I propose to you today that as we think of all the different gardening that takes place this year, the springtime season is, is definitely the Easter expression of new life stemming up, amen? I mean, even though I do no gardening, we have a whole bunch of flowers coming up around the parsonage. God will, will do miraculous things regardless of how poorly of a job I'm doing tending his creation. 
if God, if, if God is the gardener, then what kind of garden is he trying to produce? And that is why I brought our mind instantly to the Garden of Eden. Now, now are you familiar with the story of Garden of Eden? Yeah. It, it, you know, just, let's just go to the real basic idea. The Garden of Eden was the best. How's that for a theological term? It was just the best. Right? You could go around and you, could, you, didn't have to, you didn't have to do any raking or mulching or any of that stuff. It was just all there. And, and, and it, was just, it was just good, as God would call it. Right? So when I, think of this, when, I, when I was thinking of this story... Um, in relation to a theological breakdown and, and how am I going to proclaim it to the congregation this week, I really wanted to set my mind to a gardener. I have a lot of images of gardeners in my mind. Do you? Yeah. They're like, I remember my grandfather. He had a very, uh, very ambitious garden, and my uncle has a, has a garden, and he grows corn in. And, and I know that we, when I was a child, we would have small gardens. Um, do you have a gardener in your mind? Now, picture the perfect gardener. Right? I mean, this is about our creation stemming up new life. As we are Easter people still celebrating the Easter message, we walk in God's creation. We walk in God's garden. God's garden is more than just fruits and vegetables. It's more than just flowers, though. It's, it's, it's also, very simply put, life. Well, that's a complicated thing to put so simply, though, isn't it? It's, it's life. And in this life, we are going to see in the scripture reading that this is more than just breathing. It is more than just eating. It is God's expression of love to each and every one of you. As we still see the, the, the shadow of the cross with the linens on it, we are mindful that this is, this is not an image of death, no longer. But now an expression of the ultimate gift of life given to each of you. And this expression is through love. When I think of, um, I am the when Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener, I, I instantly think of vines climbing up a building, right? There's a couple of buildings in Westerly, these brick buildings that have vines climbing up them, and they're beautiful, aren't they? Yeah, those vines run deep. Now, I can't say that I'm, I was ever a mason, although I did mix mortar for my father and carry bricks, but I do know enough that as beautiful as it is, as those vines climb up those bricks, it is powerful. I mean, they can grasp on so much so that people, if they knew better, they wouldn't let it happen, right? Because it just <laughs> deteriorates it. But it grabs on and it climbs. It defies gravity. Life is defying all the ways of the world, the vine climbing up. Now, now if you were going to cut down some vines, right, how would you do it? Would you get your stepladder out, climb up, and start cutting and working your way down? No, I mean, I know, right? I'm being silly. You all know that we'd cut the bottom. Right? And then you start tugging on it, hoping it will come down, and hoping that it was um, maybe a grapevine and not sumac. <laughs> Life defies the ways of the world. Right? We may define ourselves so often in this world as, as, as being people who are just walking towards death, but we forget that we are Easter people, and that our God defies the ways of the world. And in, and in, in, in Westerly, right? We have our grapevines. Well, at least we have our wine. Now, now, I think this is the image that they had. This is an important biblical mem image, right? The, the idea is that the, the, the vine produces the fruit. And the fruit produced the wine, which was so, so important to the heritage of, of, the, um, of the Hebrew nation in, in the early church. right? We, we take clean water for granted, don't we? But through the vine, they found safe way to drink. Um, it, it, it was life. It was also very important to their ceremonies, their religious ceremonies, no different than it is to ours, although good Methodists use Welchers, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we keep our tradition that the fruit produces. Now, let's put our, let's put our gardening uh, caps on as we continue through the scripture. It says that he, meaning God, cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes so that he will be more fruitful. This is the sermon right here, okay? I'm going to fill it with a whole bunch of some other stuff. But, but if you get anything out of today's message, this is it, okay? God cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be more fruitful. Who is God doing this to? 
Yeah, me. Right? Us. Remember this. As we continue, this scripture may seem like, as good Christians, we're called to go out and stop pruning everyone. That's what we've got to be careful of. I'm going to, I'm going to propose. That's what we have to be careful of with the scripture reading. The scripture reading is not necessarily saying we've got to prune others, that God is pruning us. Now, I've seen... Um, I don't know a lot about this. I know that in the past when I've pruned something, you pretty much can call it a dead whatever I was pruning. Um, it just seems like I can't stop. But someone that knows what they're doing, right? You ever see this? You'll see this, this, this plant, maybe, maybe a rose bush or, or, or some other type of plant. And, and you may say to yourself, man, this thing is just dead. Right? And they'll come in and they'll prune it. And next thing you know, it will start... Um, New shoots of life will come up. Do you ever see something that looks like it's alive, and when the gardener's done, it brings it down to like almost nothing, and you're like, what did you just do? And instead it comes back tenfold. Right? So at first this may seem like one of those kind of like correct, like overcorrectional kind of God gospels, right? Where it's like, we're going to prune us up. Now you check out some YouTube sermons on this. You're going to see that, this, that your pastor's taking a lot different than a lot of other pastors out there, right? It's like, you know, I can start yelling at you guys and say, it's time for God to stop, you know, cutting the hedges, right? Pruning is healthy. Pruning brings life. Now, before God prunes, notice it sets off, it cuts off those, those, those branches that just aren't producing any fruit. Now, anybody here who's ever took a New Year's resolution, and I know we have a whole New Year's resolution when it comes to spring, especially being a beach community when we're getting ready to put on our swimming suits, that we know this series that we need to kind of trim up in our life a little bit. Think about it. The bad things in our life, God is saying, we're going to get rid of that. But it's not a matter of just getting rid of the bad stuff. It's about nurturing and about, about fine-tuning those areas that we're on the right path. See, sometimes this comes across as one, right? It almost sounds like it's saying the same thing twice. We're going to cut off the dead branches and we're going to prune the good stuff. Is two separate things. As a pastor, I hear a lot of testimonies from people where a lot of times we take that New Year resolution. How are you doing? Good, I stopped doing this. And you know we're just more than likely they're going to pick it up again. Because, because what often happens is we're so quick just cutting off the dead branches that we forget that what we're producing is still coming out of that core that needs to be pruned, it needs to be nurtured. I watched this show a while, a while back, and I'm not, I'm not a gardener. I'm not. Um, <clears throat> but I was watching about cutting hedges. And, and you, you've seen, I don't have a picture of it. You've seen it, right? You have the big hedges, and you got the person out there with that electric thing cutting it off, right? And then you end up something, um, something like this, right? And they have more magnificent. Uh, when I just got, uh, you're always spending time in Disney. My parents just got back from Florida. They'll do these amazing images, right, with, with, these, with these pruners. Well, I was watching this gardening show, and, and this guy was, um, let me reset this. And this guy was showing that that machine is, is, is like not very healthy for your shrubs. Now, maybe some of you already know about this. Let's say what happens is you go out there in the spring, you'll cut out the shape you want, you'll pick up the stuff, you'll put it in a brown bag, and you bring it down to the landfill, right? But he says what's happening is you're not pruning inside, Right? And he says, what ends up happening, and I remember the image on the show, that everything was green on the outside, but on the inside, it was all like, looked like it was dead. You know? So even though you can go around with that machine to trim it up, they say you've got to get in there, and you've got you to prune a little deeper than just what's on the surface. And I, when I was reading the scripture today, I mean, that is us, isn't it? Well, I don't want to put you on the spot. I'll put me on it, right? I'm like, that's me, isn't it? Like, like I come in on Sunday, and, I, and I, I try to, I don't do a really good job, but I try to put, you know, to spiffy myself up a little bit on the outside. And I always reflect to myself before, I, before as I prepare to preach to you, like, what is my inside like? Right? Now, I know there's areas that need to be, you know, just kind of trimmed right away. And, and, and I prune the outside, right? This week, uh, my boys and I will be getting a haircut again. And, you know, I've got to clean it up a little bit. But what about the inside? Is it healthy? Is it, is it bearing good fruit? You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I remain in you. So far, the pastor has spent a lot of time looking at myself and how I can do better, this and that, but we're forgetting something. 
that we're rooted in God. Okay? This is all the out stuff that's working. But God is the good soil that's coming in, right? God is that life. And so what we're doing is just we're preparing us to receive more and more of the life of God. Remain in me. Now, I've shared this with you before. I've been warned that you're not supposed to bring your family members into a, ser a sermon. But I, I didn't have permission to ask my son yet, so I'm going to ask for for forgiveness afterwards. Um, years ago, when my son Barry was just a little boy, um, I finished, my father and I finished a, a siding job, a, a rather, rather large uh, remodeling job for this person. And out of gratitude, this person bought, a, um, bought us both a Rosa Sharon bush. And, uh, I, and what I always find fascinating about the Rosa Sharon is how it produces the flowers late in the season. Um, it's beautiful. And, and so I did some gardening, right? And so I took this, I dug a hole, I put the plant in, I put the dirt on, and I put water in it. That's me gardening. Then I went out and I had a whole bunch of uh, dead stuff on my fence, right? And I call it stuff because, again, I'm no gardener. And I went around and I started cutting it with my hedge clippers, right? And then I went down, I put the hedge clippers down, I went in the house to get a drink, and when I came out, I couldn't find the Rose of Sharon. <laughs> I'm like, where did my Rose of Sharon go? And so I go to grab my clippers and they're gone. And I start walking to where the Rose of Sharon was and there it lie with some hedge clippers. <laughs> and my son playing off. Now I never come to the bottom of the, f I don't know if he did it or not, but. <laughs> <laughs> so I did what all good gardeners would do, right? I just stuck it back up and it walked away and it, it took off and it grew, right? No, I mean, even I knew that that was the end of the Rose of Sharon. No, no, no branch can bear fruit by itself, right? It must remain in the vine. Once, once, once we separate from the vine, there's no life. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. You know, also often you hear arguments about who Jesus is, right? We, for centuries they've fought about the Trinity and God the Father and Jesus the Son. But here we see a simple approach to the Trinity. That we need God. And Jesus flows through us. And that is the life-giving gift. We cannot bear fruit if we're not connected to both. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, interesting enough, God's saying through God's word this morning that through God and Jesus the vine, goodness comes through us. Good fruit. That's, that's hopeful, isn't it? I mean, we can be hard on ourselves so often, right? We can get run down when we feel like no matter what we do, just isn't getting the results we want. But we have a promise today that through, the, the, through God's creation and through Jesus Christ our Lord, sure, we might need to trim some branches here and there and prune those other areas that, that God wants to produce good fruit through us. <clears throat> You know, the creation story is a very interesting story because so often it's mistranslated where it says, go out and dominate the world, but that's the wrong world, word. The word is to co-create with God. And here we see this beautiful expression, this, this so, pardon the pun, but organic, yes? Where, where it's like, it's not this or that. So often in the church we forget that, right? It's like either this or that. But it's just this relationship. I, I just picture the vines growing through. If you do not remain in me, you are like the branches thrown away and wither. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. Now this is the tough part. This is where people want to go right to, well, he must be talking about hell. And if you don't, we have this beautiful image of life and growing. And if you don't do it, boom. But that's not what it's really saying. The Bible is not a dualistic message, one or the other. It's being very matter-of-fact to people who garden, who are sustaining upon the tilling, the soil. If you do not remain in me, you're like those dead branches. You're seeing it's not, it's not a curse. It's not saying I'm going to throw you into a fire. It's saying that if you're not doing these things, you're already dead. Don't you want life? You see, this is an invitation. They're like the ones that wither and, and, and you throw away. Now, I don't know about you guys. Um, I know when I was younger, 
We used to have a lot more little brush fires, right? Nowadays, everybody's always calling the fire department on you. Or, you, know, you, can't, you can't have any fun anymore, can you? No. You know, like we used to gather things up and, and you'd have a little fire. Um, I remember a story, my, my grandfather, my Pepe in Chapachet, he had that old school way of gardening and what he would do every, um, I guess he would do it, in, I, mean, I can't remember if he did it in the spring or the fall, you guys may, some of you may know, but what he would do is he'd burn the grass. And it was something, I was reading about it actually this week, and it's something that's not very favorable anymore, not because of the benefits of it, but because they say, you're going to get the fire department called on you. <laughs> but I guess what they used to do is they would come in and burn it, and it would all burn off all this stuff, and I don't know, they were talking about all the reasons why, and you have a beautiful lawn. And I remember my grandpa, I was just little, and I remember him telling me about, I said, what happened to your lawn? He said, I burnt it off. And he explained to me why he did it. And then he said, um, and I could just picture his face. He said, the fire department showed up and said I couldn't do that. And I said, oh, yeah? Anyway, if you knew my grandfather, you'd be more impressed with the face he gave. <laughs> oh, yeah? They let the fire burn out. Um, perhaps you know what I'm talking about, though. Sometimes, like, I, I mean, I know like Earl does, and these areas where, where, we, where humanity gets involved, we have all this brush that just keeps piling up and piling up. And then next thing you know, we have these massive forest fires where your son has to be called in and try to save uh, houses and such. Instead, right, the natural order of things, there is a time, there is a time for when it needs to be burnt off. And we call this part of the, partly the life cycle, right? But these areas in us, it's not condemning. It's just the natural way of life. We need to burn off these things and bring back new life, new areas for growth. If you remain in me and my, and my word remains in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to my disciples. I'm not going to spend time today on prayer and moving mountains and all that. We'll save that for another sermon for another day. But I want to continue focusing on, on what God's promise is in this message. This is not about condemning. This is about how does the church, it's not condemning those that don't believe. This message is for the church. For you are blessed, for you heard the word. This is for us, where we can say, we need to cut some of this off here. In me, right? Because we always want to say, in them. And then where do I need to be pruned? For the glory of God, so I can produce fruit. And I put here just the story continues, because that is the, where the scripture ended. But I wanted to share a few more verses. For it says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. Can you see how these messages can be? Maybe I didn't present it the way that a lot of people present this. This is one of those messages where it's either you do this or you're going to burn. And that's not what it's saying. They say if you do this, you're going to feel an unimaginable love that you've never felt before. That thing that you are desiring right now is what's being offered to you tenfold is what this message is. This is a message of life, not condemnation. For as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. The vine brings us to the love. And this brings us to so many gospel messages throughout the whole Bible where God is transcending the heavens and the earth into one. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept just as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in His love, I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. If anyone starts trying to beat you down with the gospel, just read the next few lines. Somebody is bringing you down the Bible and they stop, just open the Bible and read the next line. You don't need to be a great theologian, just read it. Man, all you're hearing is love in this. Love. I almost was going to play a Beatles song today for you guys. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. You see, this message has so often used to beat people down. This vine brings us love. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one life for, that, for one's friend. All right. At Bible study this week, I was sharing... Um, a story I've shared with you all before, my friend um, Janu, um, that served at Cornerstone at the time, and he was sharing, um, he would say the prayer, and he, and he would say that, you know, he would end it with God, our lover. And I remember a couple years later, I said to him, I said, wow, that's very, 
that's very bold of you. At first it made me very uncomfortable to have such an intimate relationship where God would be called as a lover. And I remember we would drive into the Cape and, and I, I was sharing this. I'm like, man, at first it made me squirm in my seat when you kept describing week after week as God is my lover. And, and, and I said, I finally got your understanding. I, I, I finally, it took me years, but I, I think I understand your theology. And he's like, what are you talking about? And he said, I, all I meant to say was God is love. He was mistranslating it into something more intimate. And he was like, I can't believe all this time people are thinking like, I said, well, like, like a husband and a wife. He's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and here I am like, hey, I finally understand your deep theological reflection. <laughs> <laughs> Got to rethink that one, huh? And I have rethought that. And I just shared this the other night. We had a good time sharing this conversation on Wednesday. <laughs> And then I come to this passage today, and it says, um, no one has a greater love than this, to lay down one's life for, one friend, for one's friends. And I realize that um, when you do a little examination in, um, in the Greek, it's philio in, in, in the action of the verb, and, it, and it, it, kind of, it, it really means for your lovers. And, you know, don't take, don't take love. Right? The world will take love and it will, it will pervert it, right? Um, there's an old joke on the internet where they, they change the church sign. It's like this week's sermon series is going to be God is the author of, uh, God is the creator of sex. Join us this Sunday. Um, <laughs> we take things and we pervert it, Right? We even take something as beautiful as love and we make it and we make it something taboo. When I read this today, I thought it was so I thought it was so ironic that we're just sharing this story on Wednesday. It says, no one has a greater love than this, to lay down one's life for those that are that they love. But you had to put friends in it because it's not just those that you love, right? It's it's all of those around you. And it continues all through this now. For you are the ones I love. And, 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 you, and you, my friends, if, if, if you do what I command you, if you that I love do what I command you, because remember, this is for the church. I do not call you servants any longer because the servants does not know what the master is doing. But I call you all the love of my heart because I have made known to you everything that I've heard from my father. This is my commandment, that you love one another that I have loved you. Now that's where it gets hard, because it's hard enough at times to love ourselves, isn't it? But here we have this commandment to go out and to love others. But I would propose that perhaps this is, this is where the vine and the pruning and the branches all come together, that as we love, we receive <laughs> of love, perhaps. For no one knows a greater love than to do this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. For you are my friend, and if you do what I command you, I do not call you servants any longer because the servants do not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends. And it's better than besties, right? It's that I love you because I have made known that everything that I have heard from my father. Remember when you read the Gospel of John that it's a very intimate story for the church, for the believers. Okay, I'm not saying it's not for the whole world, but it's written specifically with you in mind. Now, I have to share this really quick. I've shared this with you before, but um, when I heard this, it reminds me of a conversation I had um, many years ago at a Bible study and asked her for permission. <laughs> but when we were talking about this in Bible study, it says, how can I lay down my life for others? That's hard, right? And I apologize if I'm broken records. I know I've preached this to you before. But how do we lay our life down for another person? That's so difficult. But if we receive the call and we recognize that God gave us his son, and he laid his life down for us. Not to leave death, but to conquer death. To bring new life. And we recognize that our call is to do this. I'm not asking you today to die for someone. But I'm asking you to live for someone. Amen? If you can't, this is how I've said it to you before, if you can't die for someone because it's too hard, I understand. But let us stop living for someone. Always mindful that we are to the vine that is connected to God. Amen? Amen. Amen.